Hello, good afternoon. It's nice to see everybody. I'm uh, Karina Rotenstein. I'm the conference programmer, and welcome to the TIFF Industry Conference. Uh, this afternoon's session, Know Your Film, New Online Tools for Monetizing and Marketing, is part of our Dialogues program, and I'd like to thank the OMDC for their support. Today's session introduces online platforms aiming to empower you, filmmakers, with access to information and to help you realize the full potential of your film. We also examine the role analytics play in the film industry as a whole. Uh, the chair of today's session is Stephen Follows. I will bring him out and he will introduce our guests. Uh, Stephen Follows is a London, UK based uh, award winning writer, producer, and film industry analyst. His film research on gender equity and film industry data analytics has been featured in the New York Times, The Times, The Telegraph, The Guardian, The Daily Mail, The Mirror, and Newsweek, amongst others. And for all of you who want some great tips on how to best navigate TIFF as an industry delegate, do check out his report at stephenfollows.com. He did a really nice piece. So please welcome to the stage Stephen Follows and our guest René Bastien, CEO of Synaletic. <laughs> Sajid Qureshi, Vic Nair from Showbizy. And Nick Soris, CEO of Go Digital. Take it away. Uh, you can all hear me, can't you? Good. Oh, I'm echoing that suitable evidence that you can hear me. Um, welcome, everyone. We've got a, a fantastic panel and some great um, demonstrations to show you in a second. Um, I think anyone who's here uh, knows how important data is. And the film industry has been a bit slow to get on, I'm, I'm sure you guys agree, a bit slow to get on the bandwagon of how useful data can be in every part of the filmmaking and selling process. So um, it's really exciting to be able to see these new cutting edge tools that you kind of look at and go, oh, of course, thank God. <laughs> Finally, this thing exists. Um, and it's also actually in the hands of everyday producers rather than just Hollywood and um, their huge sort of budgets. Um, I'm going to ask the, the guys here to introduce themselves and then uh, when they come to do their talk. And they're going to talk for about 15 minutes about their platform. And you'll be able to see some of the things that are available. And then at the end, we've got about 15 minutes to do a Q&A. And there will be volunteers running around with microphones. So if you've got a question, put your hand up and wait till you have the mic. And uh, we should be able to talk about the platforms. And if there's time, about the role data can play within the industry. So without further ado, if you can, Renee, if you want to up to the mic and introduce yourself and your platform. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, being here today and giving us an hour of your um, precious TIFF schedule uh, to listen to what we have to say. Uh, and thank you, first of all, uh, also TIFF and uh, Karina Rottenstein uh, to invite us and give us the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Rene Bastian, and I'm a co-founder of Synalytic. Uh, Synalytic is uh, an online uh, platform, uh, an online service that's going to provide the um, international film industry with a system of uh, data analytics and decision support tools. Uh, it is our mission to make our business overall more informed, more efficient, uh, and to introduce systems of valuation and uh, business procedures. Um, the site is currently in closed beta. Um, this is the first time we're actually showing it live to uh, an audience, but you can go to it uh, if you find it interesting and sign up to become a beta tester or a user once we uh, launch later in the fall. Um, I uh, look around and I see a few familiar faces in the room, and the ones of you that know me will know me as a producer. I have a production company based in New York named Belladonna Productions. Um, for the past 20 years, I've been producing independent films with a particular focus on international co-productions. Um, I've worked with partners from all around the world, and I'm here to report that the way we make movies is equally complex and often cumbersome just about anywhere on earth. Uh, as a matter of fact, a few years ago, I got so frustrated with the way we do business that I felt myself confronted with the choice to either go out of the business and do something else with my time, which I didn't want to do because I love making movies, um, or try to do something to make it better. Um, and Synalytic is very much uh, the expression of that uh, desire. I have two cohorts uh, on that mission. My two business partners and co-founders, uh, Dev Zen, who's a rocket scientist currently employed by NASA, where he specializes in probabilistic risk assessment in space travel. And uh, <laughs> Tobias Kweiser, who's a fellow German uh, and fellow producer based in London, 
um, who comes uh, to the party with a very strong background in finance. So I don't know to what extent I need to explain to this room what I mean uh, when I say that the way we do business in film is highly inefficient, but let me just highlight some um, important highlights. Um, first of all, films are very expensive and time consuming to make while the ultimate financial success uh, is very hard to determine. Uh, when we finance a movie, we uh, finance against a package which is the combined value of a screenplay, director and cast, all three values which are um, highly subjective, highly volatile and vary greatly from country to country and there's no objective way to measure them. Uh, ultimately, uh, to get to financing, we need movie stars, and the problem with movie stars is that there's only 10 of them on Earth, and we can't agree on who they are. Um, ultimately, uh, we, we enlist uh, the help of foreign sales agents in determining the price of our product, and we must be the only industry in the world where the producers ask a third party what, their, what the price should be for their product. And if all goes well, and the film actually goes made uh, and premieres at a great festival such as this one, TIFF um, and sales and distribution companies all around the world, we basically cease to understand what's going on and important, <laughs> <laughs> it's true, and important business data such as P&A, uh, VOD, SVOD, DVD, TV, performance data is largely unknown to us. Um, that is going on in the 21st century, the age of almost perfect information. Um, and today there was actually, I don't know if you caught it, a very interesting announcement because uh, New York-based distribution company The Orchard announced that they were going to give full transparency and report all business data on the films to their filmmakers. And that is the beginning of a trend in my mind that we want to be an important part of. Uh, I think that uh, transparency and reporting is going to be an important decision-making factor for filmmakers as to which distributor they want to work with. And uh, the old uh, days uh, were uh, a quote came about that is one of my favorites from a distributor friend of mine who when interviewed and asked about why his company does not uh, release VOD data, he responded by saying because the numbers don't tell the whole story and would just be confusing to people as if we were <laughs> children easily confused by the complexities of uh, VOD numbers. Uh, in reality, uh, the statement is obviously absolutely wrong. The numbers do tell the whole story. We just need all of them, and we have too few of them. And when I say that, I say that to you as a creative producer who, much like the rest of us, prides myself in my instinct, talents, and intuition. But great success in all business comes from a combination of great instinct and great information, and the latter is sorely missing in the film industry. So without further ado, uh, here is Synalytic, which uh, is um, uh, one way of looking at it, sort of the Bloomberg terminal for, for film, where ultimately once it's fully formed and it's not, you will find uh, all kinds of uh, business data and decision support tools that will help you make uh, uh, better business decisions. Um, when I say this also, I feel a little bit like uh, a, a filmmaker presenting my first cut to an audience. This is a first cut. It is not fully formed. Um, uh, it is not color corrected, there is no sound design, uh, there is no music, and the visual effects are temp. So every once in a while I'm going to point out what, uh, and ask you to imagine what it will be. Um, so uh, let me give you a sort of a top line uh, uh, navigation uh, idea here. This is my project where as a producer or a studio or uh, whoever you might be, um, uh, will house all of your projects in one place with all pertinent information about that project. Um, here we have a search data functionality where we can search films and we have 24,000 films with performance data in the system and uh, search talent, writers, directors, uh, uh, producers uh, and actors. And then we have here um, you know, a, a data repository uh, organized by genre and talent organized by uh, what they do. But let's go to my projects which is maybe a great way into it. We're actually developing uh, a project called It Follows Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you can uh, edit it once you set up your project for the first time. Uh, you can put in uh, what development phase it's in, if it's development, packaging, financing, etc. cetera. Um, what genre, this is a horror film. Uh, Steven's being followed by a gigantic frog. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be NC-17 rated. It's a UK production at a budget of $500,000. Uh, the tags are animal, frog, and creature, uh, which is going to help you categorize. And you can upload a poster, as you saw, and the script, and the log line, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, all just aside, here's an actual uh, project of ours uh, about Maria Callas and Aristotle Onassis, which we are developing. Um, here is some of the core information of it. 
And uh, the first thing you do once you launch your project, you want to package it. So uh, you have a, a screenplay, but now uh, you need a director and you need cast and you need writers and uh, maybe you need producing partners. Um, and you can search and organize and find them all here. In this particular case, we're working with Nikki Caro. So you can look at Nikki's um, uh, page, um, her credits. Uh, you can look at how, uh, what her films were, uh, who worked on her films, if she won any awards what the performance was uh, by country. You can organize the performance of their films by country so you know where she may be more or less uh, uh, popular and you can gauge the interest of her films or the interest uh, in the filmmaker um, here. And this is just a stand and this is sort of Google clicks where you see you know, uh, attention paid to the person but there's gonna be different matrix such as uh, past performance in terms of box office but also Twitter feed, social media and, and, and things of that nature. Um, let me go back uh, to here uh, and maybe illustrate uh, what might happen in the, in the most cumbersome uh, of things that we have to do in the packaging process, which is the attaching of the cast. Here you have the various roles. There's the role of Maria Callas, where we already have an actress attached, but now we've got to find um, Onassis. And one of the visual effects, big explosions that we're planning on having is that you can work on this as a team. So everybody who has cast approval uh, can be uh, on this, um, can add names to this list, can subtract names to this list, um, can uh, write notes uh, and thoughts, uh, and then ultimately once you decide on actor, you press attached, and then um, that person is attached via package. Um, then uh, we're going to film comps. So this is um, one of the hard pieces of our site which is not yet launched, which is a, is a predictive model where, where we take uh, business data and after profiling your films, we're gonna use um, algorithms, uh, including machine learning, to, to predict the performance of your film by territory and different media. That is not implemented yet up until that point we're using comps. Um, and the way that works is now there is already a lot of films that we think are comparable to our movie in this uh, system, uh, pre-populated, but um, uh, the way to add films is that you would go in and you say, you know, we are making a film which is a drama um, and, the, and, oh, by the way, I should maybe point out um, here uh, are the 24,000 films in our database. Uh, and uh, as you see, as I put in filters, it's going to uh, count down. And here's a drama, and then there's 10,000 uh, titles, and um, the budget is in this range. So there's now 655 titles which compare to yours. Uh, we are only interested in the last six years or so, um, and now we're down to 210 titles. Uh, the film is in the English language, which is an important one. Now we're down to 185 uh, titles, and let's say the, uh, we think the rating would be PG-13. And now there is 65 films that you can uh, go through, and I'm just going to demo this quickly, uh, and uh, even though there are pretty bad comps here for my movie, but you pick two or three, <laughs> and um, uh, say add to project, and now they're part of your film uh, comps. And I just did a navigation mistake, but never mind, here we are. What is great about that is now that you have these titles, you have the economic data, the opening screens, the widest screens, uh, their rating, their budget, their US box office, international uh, box office, and global box office. And at the end, we give you a little bit of uh, summary, namely the median, the average, the high, and the low of the budget, the US box office, the international box office, and the global box office. And you see that these films uh, actually perform quite well. And, uh, and the uh, US box office average was 35 million international 41.79. So this then goes on to the financials and uh, I'm running out of time. See, it takes 18 months to make a movie and I have five minutes to tell you about it. Uh, down here, you can put in the financial assumptions, uh, core economic matrix, uh, budget, uh, estimates of P&A, domestic and international um, tax credits, um, financing cost assumptions. You don't want to look at these data right now all too closely anyway. The profit participants uh, and um, certain forecast assumptions, domestic and international throughout the value chain. Um, you have here uh, and the ability to put in the sales estimates you get from your uh, sales agent and a cool tool that we're soon to launch is actually a MG Calculator where we actually um, met with acquisitions executives who told us how they uh, buy territory actually calculate how, uh, the, the prices they offer you as a filmmaker. So we will actually give you the ability to calculate what the sales price should be. So you have checks and balances uh, in a market situation. Here's the, uh, the finance plan, um, the domestic forecast, which is in this case derived from the comps. Um, so these are the numbers that I showed you at the bottom of the comp list. 
and then we run it through a waterfall, and you see that this is actually quite a nice uh, financial proposition, even in the low case, uh, this film, uh, you can make a business case that it will be uh, profitable in the US um, as well as internationally. And then we cast this into an ROI waterfall throughout, where you can at the end uh, show your investor that uh, this is actually should be a mistake, see, but it loses <laughs> money in the low case. Um, I have that because I changed the comps just now. It looked much better before I put the other movies in there. <laughs> uh, but then in the median case uh, and in the high case, quite profitable. Um, so that is what we have today. We're going we're gonna to add uh, distribution tools um, where you see which distributor by territory fares better with a film like yours. Um, and uh, one exciting thing that we're integrating, that's my last sentence and I have to bugger off, is that we had just li licensed an interesting new data source, which is actually piracy data. They, they track uh, illegal downloads. Uh, from around the world and uh, realize that they correlate almost 100% accurately to legal uh, downloads. Um, so while VOD data is not accessible to a lot of people, we have now this sort of as an interesting gauge. Synalytics, thank you very much. Thanks, Rene. Thanks for that. Um, you didn't plan to come to TIFF and prove your film would lose 100%, did you? No, no, exactly. <laughs> on, on, a, on a big better. stage. But, <laughs> um, that's low case, though. Yeah, that's okay. That's the low case. That's right. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I think we'll hold questions until the end so we can ask them all. Um, Nick, if you want to go up and um, show your presentation. Uh, if you give a round of applause for Nick, please. Hi, my name's Nick Sorries. Um, I have uh, been in the industry for a little over 10 years. Started making movies right out of high school. Uh, raising money from cousins, parents, uh, uh, and over a period of, of the first seven years, I produced five feature films, um, all got out into the major marketplace, Blockbuster, Hollywood Video, um, but uh, a, a penny never came back to the content creator. Um, so after seven years of awkward barbecues with my family and friends for not paying them back, uh, I decided to stop and try and change the industry. Um, it was very frustrating because I, I, I talked to uh, all of my filmmaker friends and they all had the uh, same experience. Um, so with that, I, I, I wanted a tool where I didn't have to use a company uh, that would then use another company to use another company to then go direct with the platform. And then there was five people in between that would take a chunk before it came back to the producers or whoever created the movie. Uh, I wanted a product that I could, almost like a checkout page, go select where I wanted to go, get on it, and keep 100% of the revenue. Um, so now, 10 years later, uh, I think I'm there, uh, hopefully, and uh, that's what I'm about to show you. Um, so, Distributor is a, uh, basically exactly what I just explained. It's, it's a company that allows you to access the marketplace. You have a film, you want to get out in the marketplace, no problem. Um, let's see. So exactly as I envisioned, I wanted a, a checkout process. So this is our website, basic platforms that we have. Uh, you click the Submit Now button. Fill out some basic information about yourself and your film. And check out, right? So, we have direct deals with iTunes, Netflix, Hulu, Vudu, uh, all the major VOD, EST platforms, and SVOD platforms. Um, you uh, 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 select them here and pay, right? So it's, it's that simple. Uh, it's, it's the product I always envisioned uh, that was never out there in the industry. Uh, once you selected your platforms and checked out, just upload your assets, right? So your ProRes, feature film, artwork, uh, trailer. Uh, this dashboard here will track all your assets um, and uh, get you into our, our production, right? So, so we get all your assets in. Um, for you, it's easy. You just come in, use the dashboard, upload, and then let me see, I think you need to go here. And then this is where you track the process of, uh, or I should say the life cycle of your title. So as an example, you chose iTunes and Google Play. Uh, the module here will show the process of, or, or I should say, what's, what status it's in um, throughout the life cycle. So there's no questions. You can always log in your dashboard and see where, where your film's at. Um, there are 
oh, you know what, there are some slides of sales data, right? I think you mentioned Orchard um, finally is going to start offering data to their filmmakers. Um, excitingly enough, we've been doing that for three years. So uh, I can't wait to show you. Uh, this is a case study, and I purposefully left out a couple slides in the, uh, uh, the demo because I integrated them here with this case study of a title that just used our service about four weeks ago. Uh, it was called, it's called Range 15. It was produced by um, some uh, filmmakers that were not happy with Hollywood. Uh, they, they tried to get their movie made. Nobody, nobody wanted to make it the way they wanted to. They, they wanted to put in uh, some talent they didn't want, and, and it just wasn't working out. Uh, so they decided to go the distributor route, which they had just heard of, um, and I'm going to show you what happened. So they, they raised $1.1 million on Indiegogo, uh, which is really important because it's creating a, uh, a user base that we'll, I'll explain later how, how we were able to monetize. Uh, we were able to get them up on Amazon and iTunes. And this, this is where the fun stuff comes in. So this is the, uh, uh, their sales dashboard. So in Distriver, you log in, there's a lot of modules to your left. Uh, this is day to day, right? So, so every day they were able to log in, track their sales. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but uh, the peak there is actually eighty-two thousand um, dollars in one day on one platform. Um, and and as it, I, I can't walk because I don't have my <laughs> mic, right? Uh, as it actually swoops down, that that little hump right there, as it goes down, maybe a weekend. Those are actually twenty thousand dollar days. Um, and what's, what's unique about Distriver is you keep 100% of your revenue, right? So every time they log in, they see this, they know that that money's coming to them and it's gonna come to them every month. Uh, and so I think that that's unique. I think it's a tool that I wish I had when I was uh, getting screwed <laughs> from my distributors. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is about four weeks um, and I think we have some more results. Oh, and then we also offer some d data, right? I, I mean, I don't know what filmmakers are going to do with this data. I just know that we get it as, as the direct partner with iTunes and other platforms. Um, so I just project it out. Uh, what filmmakers do with it, I'm not sure. Um, I just want to be a as transparent and, 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 again, create what I wish I had. Uh, so they can track uh, uh, SD versus HD, rentals versus purchase, the uh, uh, territory. Um, best performing day, again, not sure what benefit that's going to be, but I want it there so they can see filmmakers are very creative. You never know what they can come up with. Um, so this was really neat. This is something that's, uh, that we've been working on for a while is tracking your conversion rates. Uh, so when a title goes live on iTunes or another platform, we actually generate uh, a special link that we will give you to then share with your audience. Uh, that link is then tracked and, and, and through our API comes into our dashboard where you can see there's 10,000 clicks, 15 countries reached, 32% conversion rate. That's a conversion rate to sale. Uh, and here we have uh, line graphs, just some more data, and um, uh, 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 let's see, yep, same, same as above, but, but, but with the line graph. So uh, again, not 100% sure where the, uh, the future's going. I just know that we have this data and I'm gonna give it to the filmmakers. Uh, but I think the conversion rate's really neat. We just launched that last week. Amazon results, they, I think that, uh, yeah, the August, $257,000. Again, there's nobody in the middle to take this money out of their pocket. Uh, it's going directly to them. Uh, the results in a four-week period, uh, EST VOD, 700,000 plus, DVD sales, 200K plus, uh, Total in the four-week period, $1.2 million. Uh, they are net profit at $760,000 right now. Um, I don't believe they could have done this had they gone a traditional route, uh, which is, again, really exciting. Uh, uh, my goal in this, in this my, my entire venture is just to democratize film distribution. Uh, so I think I'm one step closer with, with uh, what we have here. Um, Okay, this is the fun part. I don't know what time, how much time I have left, but seven? All right, 
So I'm gonna go over how we did it. And it was basically uh, uh, try, understanding the audience and what an audience is, right? So here I have a, a definition. The assembled spectators or listeners at a public event such as a play, movie, concert, or meeting. Uh, something that's important to understand is the word assembled. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, uh, an audience is an audience ready and willing to buy your product. Uh, that is not true. Uh, and I'll go into the two differences here. So there, there's, there's two types. There are direct fans, right? So th these are people that are, are ready to buy. So, so uh, 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 pros, they're ready to buy. People who, who donated on Indiegogo. Um, the cons, they're hard to obtain. Uh, if everybody could, could go on Indiegogo and, and raise $1. million, we all would. So it's, it's not the easiest to obtain. Uh, the other is an organic user. So this, this organic user is a person that is organically on iTunes, a Hulu, people you don't know, the people that you actually you want to reach to see your content. Uh, those are people on these platforms looking at typically top 10, 20, 30 movies. Uh, the, the question is, how do you reach both of them? Right, so here at the bottom, this is a little idea I had to, to try and visually explain uh, how we did this. So we have our audience, and the circles above represent different platforms. So iTunes, Amazon, Xbox, Google Play. Uh, a traditional release um, sends the audience to multiple platforms. Um, what we decided to do was a little bit different because we, we, had, we had great data. We knew how many people we had that were ready to buy. Um, these were, were, were Indiegogo fans that, that were, were almost starving for the content. Um, so understanding this next uh, slide is, is important and I'm gonna explain why we did this. So we decided to direct all of them to one platform and that was to take advantage of the, of the platform's EST VOD, uh, I don't know, we just call it algorithm, um, but basically how they rank, right? Because the goal uh, uh, is to get out of the weeds. Uh, typically on, on EST VOD platforms, no matter who you are or, or, or what kind of movie it is, you, you, your product starts at the bottom. Uh, and the only way to, to break out, and, and those arrows at the top represent organic traffic, people who are just searching on these, these platforms ready to watch your movie. Uh, the, the only way to break out of the weeds is to have sales. Uh, a lot of people think it's actual you know, dollar amounts or reviews. Um, it's actually, most of them are based on units, units sold. Uh, so if you understand that, we can, I, I don't wanna say take advantage of the system, but um, try and make some money. <laughs> uh, so so get, how do we get out of the weeds? So, so if I told you, and this is just an example, um, in a 24 hour period, uh, that that breaking out of the weeds was 600 units. Um, 600 units sold, that you would actually break out of the weeds and, and be able to get up there and hit that organic traffic, the people who are looking for, for good movies. Um, so that's actually what we did. Uh, it, it's based on years and years of data that we've collected at the Striver. Um, this is what we do with every title. We look and, and strategize on, on how, to, how to maximize revenue. Uh, because I think that that's what's missing in the independent film uh, world right now. Uh, so we were able to break, break the barrier, get the organic traffic, uh, and then what happens is a snowball effect. Uh, we have tens of thousands of people buying that are direct fans, people that he knows. Uh, what happens when you break the barrier, uh, you start collecting organic traffic, right? Once you get that organic traffic, you're gonna get some conversions. So uh, you get organic buys. Uh, and then as those people acquire your content, um, it, it's more and more units sold. And so you create this snowball effect. And what we were able to do with uh, uh, range 15 was uh, jump, get it up all the way to the number two position overall um, on iTunes, which generated in the, in the, the, the numbers that you've seen before. Uh, let's see here. So the takeaways, um, knowing your film. I think we put that title there because that's the title of this panel. <laughs> uh, build an audience. Uh, create content that your audience wants. Uh, strategic platform releasing, uh, understanding the platforms, how they work. Uh, don't offer a free download to your fans. One of the biggest mistakes that, I don't know, I, I, I shouldn't call it a mistake, but something I don't recommend doing if, if you have a kick, successful Kickstarter or Indiegogo project is uh, offer your movie for free. You know, give, give the t-shirts, give all the, the swag, but, but 
reserve that, that movie download uh, for when you launch it on a platform that has potential hundreds and hundreds of millions of users so we can break the barrier uh, and um, have a success. Uh, think about distribution early in the process. Um, and yeah, that's, that's Distriber. I, I, th I th think I've democratized film distribution, we'll see, but uh, <laughs> thank you for your time. Brilliant. Thank you for that. That's great. It's um, always nice to come away with those sort of slightly counterintuitive takeaways, like the, the idea of not giving away your film to the people. You know, that kind of is an interesting thought and something that um, is probably counter, quite counterintuitive. And um, I don't know about you, but that 600 number sounds very low to me. It sounds very achievable, you know, like very sort of, it doesn't seem as unsurprising. But I'm sure we can come into that in the questions. Um, our final presentation. Um, so I just want to take the stage and um, give a round of applause, please. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you to Karina and Tiff for having us this year as well, and to be next to such an innovative platform such as these two gentlemen. Uh, my name is Saj Qureshi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Showbusy, and Vic Kneo on the stage here is my co-founding partner. We are a platform, and we initially started as a, I guess, more of an interactive e-commerce solution for studios. We launched with 20th Century Fox with the film The Kingsman, and then after that success, we quickly realized that we needed to really focus on engagement to be able to provide the tools to really monetize that relationship for studios or films with their audiences. So this is a famous quote by Mark Twain that there's three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. So analytics, right? And you know, analytics are something that are very important. It's, you know, every studio I'm at, every company we're dealing with, they're very aware that they want to have all that analytic data but they don't really know what that means. And for that, I think we need to step back to think that without engagement, your analytics are not useful. You need to have created that engagement with your audience, with that content that you have, to be able to get people interested in what you're doing. And that results in valuable analytics that you can then apply. <coughs> the biggest challenge, though, is how do you get that attention from those audiences, especially with so much more competitive content out there? Now, you know, all the various formats we have right now from like TV shows, web, music, social media, even just online, the various formats that are out there, right, all very good at what they do specifically, but very fragmented. Like we look at Instagram, Instagram is very good at images and clips of video. Twitter is very good at segments of text. YouTube is great for longer forms of video, for example. But these are all ad hoc and fragmented right now. And then how do you inform people about your brand or your product itself from there? It's not as simple as just posting it up online or putting it up on a website because the way consumption has changed now, people, it's very difficult to drive people just to a website itself now. People have a universe of sites that they engage with. Like, I'm guilty of that as well, that maybe I've got five sites including social media platforms that if I'm not exposed to that content there, that I'm not seeing what you're trying to uh, show me. Advertising, you know, there's an entire massive industry regarding blocking advertising online. So that then comes into play, and we can assume that as time goes on, that'll become much more refined and much better at blocking other forms of advertising that we use to get around things such as ad blockers and spam blockers right now. And then popularity. This is an interesting one. You know, now we're looking at predictive analytics coming into the market. Uh, you know, five years ago, predictive analytics weren't a household term in the industry itself now. And clicks or view counts as well. You know, overlapping with something that Renee was talking about earlier as well, one of the interesting businesses that I've heard of is that they actually monitor rips of trailers off YouTube to be able to predict what a theatrical opening will be. And they're quite accurate as well. But the metrics that they gather from that, going back to what you were talking about, about illegal downloads being a very direct correlation between the popularity of a film or content from there. And going back to the counts or clicks, I think anyone that has any kind of a social media account's gotten the offers of click me and I'll get you 10,000 followers and that. So when it comes to the real value of having numbers following you, are they something that will benefit you? Will they drive that actual content or are these just numbers that you're trying to add onto your actual ranking? What you need to do is create content that people want to engage with. 
the, and we look back to movie studios, like the movie trailer itself, movie trailers are probably one of the best forms of advertising there are because, you know, and I guess I'll use a, a massive example, like the Star Wars trailer is about to come out, and you start seeing people share that across the board on social media itself. It's entertaining, it's people want to see it. It's not something that you have to force upon people from there as well. Movie studios are very good at creating that early format itself. And then it comes down to what I was just saying, that it can't be something you're trying to force upon people. Like if you're on Facebook, I pretty much block out any advertising on that side. And I look at people, or I have a three-year-old son, the way he consumes content, content consumption has changed so drastically at this point as well that we don't want to consume content with advertising in it. When he's watching Paw Patrol, it's binge watching, right? So if he's watching something on YouTube, if an ad comes up, it's basically breaking his concentration on his content. He's not, he's not a, a, a pleasant experience. <laughs> <laughs> and then we look at where that content is now. You know, we're putting it up on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook, and again, this is fragmented. And now it comes back to how do you get people to engage in all of these different formats itself? And, you know, everything we do online, whether it's on your mobile phone, whether you're on a website, whether you're on a platform, there's analytics behind everything. Whether or not they share them with you is a different story. But analytics follow engagement. So if you're going to take benefit, take advantage of those analytics, you have to create strong engagement first. And this is where we come in. We created a platform, which is interactivity.com. And essentially, we're a multimedia platform that combines text, video, social media, under a SaaS model, into a content hub itself. And what I mean by that is that we're a new format that essentially is, we're, we're more than a tweet, but less than a website. We're somewhere in between there right now. And I'm gonna show you a, uh, a live application here. So our platform is live right now. So this is interactivity.com. I'm gonna show you one example with one of the films that tiffed this year with uh, one, of, one of the distributors we work with, D Films. And the simple application, when we're sitting with some of our studio partners even, is that what is the probability that once someone has viewed your trailer, that they're gonna go and engage with your Instagram, your Twitter, go to your website, or any of those other various formats that you are investing on online right now. And the answer to that is the probability is very low, almost zero, unless again, you're a brand like Star Wars where people are striving, they're hunting to find content they can consume from there. Our vehicle, in the simplest form, takes those fragmented touch points online and packages them into one vehicle. So in this version of the player itself, which is the simple one I'm showing, you can play that trailer itself here for this film, which I suggest you all watch at the festival this year. But at the same time, you also then have the Twitter feed embedded right in, which is also completely, completely functional at the same time. If you want to try to drive them out to, whether it's IMDb, whether it's your own site, or what has come back to be very prominent is email signups now. Because if you have an email signup, you can now create push notifications. So across the board, we work with many blue chip brands, the studios, Email signups are always a priority right now when dealing with whether it's a customer base, an audience, a fan base. Now, most importantly, this vehicle is shared just like you would embed a YouTube video or share it. So it's not about driving people to interactivity.com. This becomes a tool for them. So when they're placing their content online, as opposed to it being just the trailer itself, whether their focus is e-commerce, whether it's exposing the content purely, whether it's maximizing engagement, We've created a blank canvas, which is a vehicle for them to dictate what their mandate is. And by saying that, you know, when we work with some of the, the biggest studios out of Hollywood, we don't expect them to come and tell us their intimate strategies for marketing. So we've made it an easy tool for them to be able to create and deploy. And when I say we're more than a, a, a tweet, but less than a website itself, this vehicle creates the opportunity to be able to tell those stories in different formats itself. Now, to show you a, a basic example of how it sits, here's an example of a, a page we created here. And it sits very similar to how you would see a YouTube video or a JW player sitting online. Why this becomes important now is going back to 
how engagement and how consumption has changed online. If you're not able to put your content and have a call to action driving back to whatever it is you're trying to achieve, in the case of a film, whether it be a ticket sale, whether it to be maximizing the engagement if you're in pre-production, production before it's been released from there as well, you're losing out that opportunity. Because all of these formats are very valuable, being able to package them into a content hub itself then creates more efficiency in those analytics that you then collect from there itself. So it's not purely about it being that I've thrown up a trailer and that's gonna make people come running to me and buy my tickets. Being able to then learn who your audience is from those resulting analytics. One of the interesting things that, that happened with us as we were growing, like when we launched with The Kingsman, it was an interactive version of the trailer and Matthew Vaughn had created a clothing line and it was you could touch the, the shirt or you can buy that shirt from the trailer itself. And that was really interesting from the point of view of, okay, that's great, you're, you're driving transactions, you're driving sales, and it's interesting, it's fun for people, but how do you really take advantage of that engagement? It's not, because people don't want to always be bombarded with that whenever I'm consuming your content, you're trying to sell me something. It's about being able to go and understand who your audience is. And we started hearing that a lot from TV networks and some studios as well, that they knew numbers, they knew opening weekends, they knew ticket sales, they knew Nielsen ratings, but they didn't know who their audience was. They didn't know what their appetites were. They didn't know how to curate content for them or know exactly what they wanted to consume. In the earlier days as well, we were very fortunate to go in to meet some very, some of the brightest minds out of Hollywood. And their view was being able to start releasing content at an earlier stage, whether it was initial artwork or pre-production from a trailer itself, being able to then take that feed, uh, feedback loop of that data itself and being able to see, is there an appetite for this content itself? Is there an appetite in certain regions but not in others? And what is it that we're doing right or wrong from there? And being able to react to that in organic matter as opposed to just saying that here's our content, we're gonna put it out there and consume it. Being able to be much more efficient in the ways that you present that and how you then monetize that relationship, whether it be from a ticket sale, whether it be from merchandise, whatever your mandate or focus may be. Now, for us, those analytics become very important across the board because then those then get used, such as the gentleman's businesses here, about what is that investment for those future productions? Why did the production work and others didn't? Why did the sales campaign work and others didn't itself? So, in the simplest sense, we are a platform, but we're a tool. We're a blank canvas for filmmakers to be able to put their content out. And whether they're attempting to monetize at an earlier stage or whether they're attempting to engage or learn lessons about who that audience is and how to feed them that content they're looking for, we've created this for the market itself. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open up in a second for questions. I've got one question I want to ask the panel first myself, but if any of you do have any questions, um, uh, start thinking about them. If there's, if there's one of the volunteers near you in the orange shirts, maybe give them a wave and they know they can get the mic to you in a second. Um, but I wanted to start by asking the panel um, a little bit about uh, their relationship with the industry and data or tracking, because to some degree, all three of you have created products out of your frustration that products don't already exist. You know, it's kind of a, a no-brainer, if you will. And, and so through that, we can see, and through our own experiences, we know that the industry is quite, not resistant necessarily, but slow to embrace these sort of new technologies. And I was intrigued as to why you think that is. I mean, it might be that something you've heard of as feedback from your platform, or whether you think it's um, that people like to see themselves as artists creating art and data and art, uh, in theory, don't mix, although I disagree. But um, yeah, so I just thought I'd, I'd go through you guys and ask you what you think the relationship the industry has with data. Um, Nick, you seem to have grabbed the mic first, so would you mind? Uh, Test. Is that, did that work? Good, yes, good. Test. Uh, Nick, so what's your, what do you think? The well, I, I think that that's actually a great question. I don't have the answer to it, but I know that we, uh, we push hard to our platforms um, to give us real-time data, right? Only, only a hand, not even a handful do. Uh, there are some platforms, um, I'm not gonna mention any names, but they're very big and they report quarterly. Um, you know, w w when you have your, your product out there and your marketing and your tracking data, you wanna know what's happening day to day so you can pivot your, your marketing strategy. 
Um, so we push real hard to all of our platforms to kind of get up to speed. Um, I believe iTunes is the best. Uh, they have their day-to-day. -day. Um, mm. But I'm, I'm hoping for one day that it'll be real time you know, for all platforms. But uh, I don't have the answer. I just, it's a very good question. And, and we push, as a company, we push all the, we push to all the digital retailers, you know, to, to give us more data uh, because we're uh, missing out. Did they give you any reason why not? Is there any legitimate reason for not giving to you beyond we can't be bothered? Um, a lot of it has to do with bandwidth on the accounting side. That's about the only excuse I've received. That doesn't sound the, the like rest, a thing, does it? Yeah, the, the rest. <laughs> sounds like they, a thing you say. We push, but we don't get answers back. Oh, good. With more questions. That's, we've come away from the Q&A with more Qs than As. But, Renee, we'll be, um, what, is your, what do you think your relationship is with uh, maybe at the very beginning of the process and the film industry? You know, what is it, it seems to me a lot of it is based on what people feel who's famous, who's hot, who's, hot, who's not, rather than the data. I mean, what's been your experience? Yeah, no, uh, uh, absolutely. And, and, and why that is, as a business culture, is, is, is a bit of a mystery, and there isn't sort of, I think, a one-sense answer to it. But I think... Um, First of all, I think we're very used to the fact that, that the, the industry is dominated by the studios. There are six of them, and they have a lot of information, and nobody else really does, and they derive their power from it. I mean, there's a handful of other you know, really successful companies, and they derive their power from having all the information and not sharing it. And, and I look back now, having done this for 20 years, you know, when, you know, when you say we're independent producers, we're independent from the studios, and we're very proud of that, right? But it really means we're, in, we're cut off from distribution and information, you know? <laughs> so it's been sort of this quixotic thing. Uh, and, and, and why do we do that to begin with? I think that people uh, who, who go into the movie business are, are, are romantic people. You know, we, we love celluloid and, and, and movie history and so on. And, and uh, you know, very smart, very talented people, but maybe not, that, you know, not of that mind. I think this is why it's taken a little bit longer. Yeah. And you mentioned in, in, sorry, in your um, presentation that uh, very often people just have no idea who their audience are or the, the demographics. That's shocking that we've gone so long and yet there's even small corners, let alone the majority of the industry. I mean, what's, your been, what's been your experience with bringing this to the audience, uh, the, the industry? Have they said, oh, yeah, thank God, we've wanted that, come straight in? Or have they said, well, why would we want to know that? Or well, With us, it started with a, a focus on and taking the benefit of the studios, I apologize. <laughs> it was, we looked at, you know, a show like House of Cards would air, and you'd see social media light up with, what were those shoes? What was that dress? What was that car? And you saw all these different entities monetizing that, but the actual rights holder wasn't taking any benefit. They didn't take any of the data. They didn't take the relationship with that customer audience member, and they definitely didn't take any of the money from that. Mm. So when we first started, it was about providing that, empowering that to the studio, saying, you're the pitch person here. They want to buy that black leather jacket because Brad Pitt was wearing that in your film, yet you're not taking any of this benefit. So it, we initially had started with that focus. And then with the success of Kingsman, uh, you know, the credit of our CTO and our other co-founding partner, Prakash, it was very much about you need to focus on engagement first. Because how many times will a fan come back if you're always trying to sell them a shirt? A, a Blu-ray, whatever it may mm. be. It had to be something that you're constantly creating that relationship that you then can understand who your audience is beyond that they want to buy a $20 shirt or a $40 shirt. Because mm. when we face it as well, you look at the market in Hollywood, when it comes to merchandise, the numbers are, are not, mm. they're not what you would think they should be. And when it comes to traffic to their properties as well, the numbers are also very low. So for us then, we pivoted to create that solution to address that. And having the success with Kingsman made it much easier for other studios to then get interested. So now that you stood up for the big guys, are you also going to allow the others? The, the, Absolutely. Yeah, good. For us, it's, the, <laughs> it's, a, it's a platform, right? For a platform to be successful, it's to allow as many people as possible to use it. That's where you create the, the maximum benefit. Although the users themselves take the benefit from being able to place that content where they see fit for their campaigns, for our side of it, that platform is very important for us to grow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything you wanted to add about the relationship with... The industry and data and actual real information. I think this is working. I think it's very interesting actually because I, what all of us here on stage are trying to do is to make something more transparent and add simplicity to the process, right? Mm. So Renee's company is trying to make the decision making and investment and and whatnot simplified in a, in a manner that's transparent and for and. And, and more friendly for people to understand what's going on in a very fractured and difficult environment. And the same thing with Nick is on the distributor side, you know, how to understand, you know, where the movies are going and what's exactly happening. So I think simplicity and transparency 
are, and including what we're doing, that's what we're trying to do as well, is to make things simple. Uh, for in, in our case, you know, aggregating or putting media together in various, that, you know, in various fractured formats and bringing it together into a simple platform. So that's where, and then from there you can take data and make better decisions and think through things and, and make, you know, understand things better. But if you look back, if you're looking at the people who are really understanding data are, are the, you know, companies like Netflix and Amazon who are vertically integrated and start off as data companies really. Mm -hmm. And they are not transparent at all. They're not helping, you know, the people who buy from, uh, you know, they'll buy your show and now they're not really telling you very much. And they know exactly what's going on, but they're not really, you know, they're, they're, they're data driven, they're analytics driven, but at the same time, they're not democratic when mm. we talk about the democracy in film. So that's a, you know, an interesting and maybe scary sort of, you know, vector. Uh, for so do you think like, that the problem then, or the lack of transparency is supply side rather than demand side? People do want this transparency, but the small number of people that hold it are just not willing to let go of it. Is that the fundamental? Yeah, that's, that's, that's I think that's something that need, people need to, concerned about in terms of, and I look at, you know, in terms of what Renee and, and Nick are doing, uh, because if, if you can put together a great show or a, a, a program, you sell it to a Netflix or an Amazon, until they're forced to give you that information, they're not going to give it to you because it's a competitive weapon for them, actually, <laughs> because they know what's selling and what's not. And that's, you know, a challenge, to be, to be honest. With. Especially, as you said, with the vertical integration of them creating content and, you know, Amazon and whatnot. Yeah. Very, very good, thank you. Um, let's open up to questions. Uh, so if you could raise your hand, uh, if you have a question. One of the, uh, uh, who, okay, whoever's got a mic? Okay, there's a question here. Wh wherever you feel, yeah. Me? Yes, yes, if you have a microphone, yeah, you can yes, ask a question, now I that's do. the rule. Yes, hello, my name is <laughs> T.R. Boyce. Um, thank you very much for the panel, first and foremost, and having this panel. Uh, I think each of you have a, uh, have a, have a niche of uh, what, what is an independent filmmaker I need. You know, I mean, uh, but there are two, two uh, really strong points that I want to make. The synthetics, uh, um, the big question for you is, and this ties to what was just being said, is how are you integrating the Amazon and, and you know, all the, all the digital information that's being held very, very close to help quantify what, what the, you know, what the, output, uh, what the potential is for any film that you're, you know, data mining, or that we're utilizing your data to mine. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for the question, first of all. And and obviously, we're we're not overnight um, uh, are the silver bullet to 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 the lack of transparency in the space. Um, it's a gradual improvement, and it's a trend, in in my opinion. Um, so w what we are doing at the moment is that we're aggregating everything we can get our hands on, and and uh, um, you know we're licensing data from some of the more known data sources, you know, like studio uh, systems and. And, and variety, et cetera. Um, and we're discovering uh, some unorthodox uh, data sources, like the, the piracy data that, that we, we came across, and uh, that is, uh, gives us a lot of insights. You know, part of our mission is to aggregate information, aggregate data, but also make it um, digestible. You know, we call it decision support tools, but we, you know, we are, where we are you know, visualizing data and sort of tell you what to do with it in, on, on some level. Um, there, there's a good handful of other data sources that are quite exciting that, that we will integrate, and, and so the picture will emerge over time, uh, and transparency will gradually increase. So uh, Netflix and Amazon may never share their data. Uh, the only thing that gives me, uh, and, 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 you know, and we can't fix that, the only thing that, that gives me hope in that direction is what I mentioned earlier, is the, the and you mentioned it, you know, they brought up the, the Orchard announcement, you know, where they say, we, we give it to you. So if I'm now a filmmaker and, and I'm at a festival and have two offers between the Orchard and Netflix, I'll give it to Orchard. So, uh, 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 so the question is, you know, over time, will, will that erode the, you know, Netflix competitive advantage? I mean, they're so powerful, those two in particular, that it may never. Um, but they're also just two players in a very, very mass, uh, mass market. So uh, I think we can still uh, provide a great service that way. Very good. Uh, so yeah, there's a question you. here. There's somebody here, yeah? Is this working? Yes, it yes. is. Uh, great demonstrations. Thank you so much. Um, I guess uh, uh, my question, we're, we're a small production company, and I'm always thinking about uh, ROI. And uh, I guess this question is for uh, uh, Nick. Um, you know, in, in the... Um, uh, music industry, we have uh, iTunes, Spotify, and then Tidal, which gives a bigger share to the artists. Can you draw some sort of comparison to streaming a film? And is there anything that you would point towards out of the weeds to just go to one direction because they give a bigger share as an end user channel? Great question. Yeah, can, can I don't think I fully under, understood. You said iTunes, Spotify, and 
what else? Title. Got it. And this is this is relevant to music. Right. That's that's exactly why we we chose iTunes. It's because of the seventy thirty split. Yeah, no, no. You're talking about ROI, right? Is that is that what you're asking? Because they they're, they're you know Amazon, I believe, is a fifty fifty split. Um, we had this this group that were ready to buy. Uh, we wanted to to monetize and maximize uh, that that group. Uh, but you also have to consider, you know, uh, there's there's Vimeo, right? That that offers ninety percent. Uh, but we didn't want to take that route, and that's that's because of the data we had showing the the lack of organic users, right? So we, we took in a lot of, of consideration. Uh, sure, we would have received uh, ninety percent on everything we sold, but we would have broken out of the weeds to get back into the weeds. Um, so we wanted to break out of the weeds to hit the organic user base uh, and and iTunes because they offer seventy percent and they offer that that user base. Uh, that was the logic behind the release. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Is there a question on this slide? Uh, some, oh, someone's got a mic already. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Kowalski. I'm a producer, and I have a question for Nick. Um, your uh, platform looks amazing. I just finished my first feature film, so I definitely want to learn more about it. But I noticed on the, uh, I guess it was the, the checkout page, there was a note at the bottom saying uh, that you would have your money refunded other than $120 or something. Um, if uh, iTunes or, or whatever service you're choosing doesn't uh, choose to accept your film. So I'm just wondering what the odds are that iTunes or Netflix will not accept my film. So that's, that's, film. It's a, that's a great question. There's a lot of variables to that question, and those variables are the individual platforms that have their individual taste. Um, you know, I, I would say as a whole, we have a good 85 to 90% success rate. Um, but when you, when you get down to the more curated platforms like Netflix, um, you know, it is harder to get on. And this is just because of their, their tastes and, and their pivots and, and their acquisition. Um, so what we do is we guarantee that in the event they do not take your title, we'll give you your money back. Nick, what's in, uh, all the films that get rejected, is there any commonalities between those? Are there any things that are common, commonly cited? That's a great question. Thank you. And again, lots of variables, so I'm going to try and answer this the best <laughs> I can. It might be not. It might be that each one is a its own prototype, but I'm just intrigued with you it. You know, on the EST VOD side, electronic, electronic sell-through and video-on-demand purchase or rental, basically, is what that means. Um, it comes down to the quality of the assets, not so much the quality of the film. Most of them will take it if, if you can pass their, 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 their quality standards. Um, when you start dealing with the SVODs, uh, it, it's uh, much more on the, the quality of the film, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, the, 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 a, a low-budget movie is going to have a hard time getting getting an offer from Netflix, but um, you know, we can get those up on iTunes and other EST platforms. So it, it's just sort of the old-school stuff, things that used to exist before, passing a QC, and obviously making sure that you've got a film that suits the the outlook and the audience. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, we've probably got time for one more question. Uh, whoever's got a microphone, do you have a microphone there? <laughs> can you can we wait just for the microphone because it is being streamed and it's uh, very irritating when you watch something and everyone just nods and smiles and then laughs randomly um, <laughs> now you have a microphone off you go thank you appreciate it uh, one more question for a distributor you talked about the uh, that 600 number for sort of that breakthrough through the weeds what are, what are you doing to get to that 600 number and is it something let's say independent filmmaker decides well I've got a little marketing money I'm going to spend how about if I just buy the first 600 myself in one day to put it up over that <laughs> level yeah so, great question. Uh, um, so that was a sample of, say, the iTunes documentary section, right? That's one click in from the homepage. Uh, you know, typically homepages of, of these these uh, uh, platforms are editorial, right? That's that's human emotion. Someone selecting a title and saying we want to promote this. Once you start getting into categories, they're typically algorithmic. Um, so again, just based on data uh, for that platform, uh, um, we could tell roughly how many it would take to break out of the weeds. Um, there's a lot of uh, barriers to prevent you from being able to go buy 600 times, <laughs> and I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you know, we want the platform, I mean, the platforms, they, they, they want to make money, right? So they want the titles that are doing the best to go to the top, right? They want those snowball effects. Um, so I wouldn't recommend doing that, uh, but, um, you know, get your audience, focus them, 
kind of like what, what we did here and, and try and break through the weeds. I can guarantee you every filmmaker who saw that 600 number did the very quick calculation, 600 times retail price, my bank balance, eh, you know, it could be a legitimate distribution cost, you know, buying the first few copies. I'm sure it's not the first time it's ever been done. Um, but no, very good. Well, no, and real quick, we've had a lot of people that, that had um, uh, five, ten thousand dollar budget to try and pay for ads to send people there. Um, uh, but what they did was they, they just uh, used this method instead, right? And, and they were able to benefit. Very good, very interesting. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, but um, we may, well, the panel may be around for a bit afterwards, I think. I'm not sure we'll f figure out if we're outside the front. Um, but if not, um, I'm sure you can get in contact with them through the delegates part of the TIFF site. Um, a huge thank you for you to joining us. Thank you to TIFF for organizing it. And if you could join me in a round of applause for our panel. Thank you so much. Please join us back in the lobby. Uh, there's coffee, there's water. We have uh, the next session up is